everybody. How are you doing? I'm Justin. Um, I've been harassing folks around here this afternoon. I apologize for running a couple minutes behind. Thank you guys very much for coming up. Um, one other thing I may consider here is the fact that, well, that's not going to happen either. Okay, uh, so I want to thank you guys for coming to our, our awesome session here. We've got a fantastic uh, and uh, frankly very famous uh, uh, guest here. Um, Keith Shepard is uh, the, the founder of the Monty Studios and uh, has found quite a bit of success for himself and for his company uh, by making amazing games like Harbor Master and Imanji and Temple Run, maybe some games that you may be aware of that uh, came out of the studio. Uh, about a year ago, they relocated here to the, the Triangle, and uh, once I found that out, and uh, John Austin from Groundworks up in the uh, uh, Durham Bulls Athletic Park, the tobacco campus, um, put us in contact, and I said, Keith, you've got to come talk and tell your story. And so what we've got today is, uh, is a conversation with Keith Shepard where I'm going to ask him a few questions and uh, certainly give you guys the opportunity to talk as well. And basically to get an opportunity to learn about sort of the thought process that went into setting up company. Um, we'll learn and hear a little bit about some of the games that they've produced and philosophies that they have at the studio and uh, give you guys an opportunity as well to ask some questions. So thank you guys very much for coming. Um, I guess we could be some Siamese buddies here and we can well, well, might be I think so. I think, I think it'll be easier. So we've got, we're recording the sessions here as well and, um, and so we want to make sure that the folks who couldn't come and, we, and mostly that we have A, captured this great information and knowledge and, and B, uh, that we have it also so that we can let the folks who couldn't come and of course the people who were here who couldn't write fast enough uh, access to this content after the show. So, so Keith and I are going to kind of switch out here and, and uh, you know, um, so my first question for you is, is really I'd like to learn a little bit about your background. Um, you know, what brought you into game development? You know, where, where did you, where did you originally come from? And can you kind of give us a little bit of insight into how you came into the game industry? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, it's actually, you know, kind of interesting. I, I didn't get into the games industry, like coming from a game, games industry, like working <laughs> in a big company and then coming to do our own studio. I actually worked in the healthcare industry, uh, making web applications uh, five years ago before I started doing this. And I've been doing that professionally for a number of years, really ever since I graduated from, from college. Um, I have a computer science background. I went to the University of Virginia and studied in, in their engineering school, studied computer science. Um, and I, um, you know, kind of going way back when I was a kid, I got into programming because I like video games and I wanted to know how to make video games. So that was kind of the inspiration for that. But when I went through school, I, you know, I, I thought, you know, kind of back in my mind, I was like, hey, maybe I'll do something with games. That'd be awesome. I'd love to do that. Um, but it was really kind of a different time. Like the only the only real jobs in the industry were working for like huge companies. And it was super competitive to, to get into those, um, you know, to get in, onto that kind of career path. And you know, you're working on these giant you know, console games where you have a huge team and you know, working on it for a number of years. And you know, it just, you know, at the time when I was in school, the really exciting stuff going on was all dot com, like e-commerce stuff. I graduated in 2001, like right at the height of the boom. So I went to work for like an e-commerce startup. and you know, kind of got into that whole world of doing the e-commerce web application development stuff. So kind of lost track of that, that game development path that I kind of originally got into programming for. But it all changed for me um, back when Apple kind of announced the App Store. I had actually, it was kind of in the right place at the right time. I had just quit my job because I was super frustrated with it. I was traveling a ton. And, um, you know, I just wasn't really f that fulfilled in what I was doing. It wasn't super you know, creative and it wasn't really allowing me to kind of you know, explore all those different aspects of my personality in kind of a professional role. So um, my wife and I made this decision that I was going to quit my job and figure out what I was going to do next. We always dreamed of starting a company. We had no idea what that company would be. Hopefully something that leveraged our skills of you know, being able to write software. Um, but we were exploring a bunch of different things. And uh, we, 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 we uh, happened to be kind of in this mindset of, you know, she was supporting us, the two of us, while I was exploring, kind of doing different things. And Apple announced that there was going to be this App Store thing. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. I had an iPhone since the day it first came out. I think my friends would probably call me an Apple fanboy because I always have Apple products. And um, I just knew that this was going to be something really neat. And I wanted to make something for it and be a part of the App Store when it first launched. Like the idea that you could create something as like a, you know, a single person or a small team and put it out there for the world to download it and buy it and pay you money for it, like that was awesome. So the first thing that came to mind was to make a game. And uh, my wife and I have been playing like a bunch of Scrabble and 
um, we were playing around with kind of like the um, little word tiles uh, or the little letter tiles on our kitchen table. We're trying to come up with some idea of like, you know, let's, let's try to come up with a new word puzzle, something unique and kind of uh, creative, and then turn that into a, a game that we can put on the iPhone. And we had about a month before the store launched, so we didn't have a ton of time. We had any artists who word puzzles were like, hey, this would be a great thing to do um, and build for, you know, two programmers that have no art, art abilities. We can draw a, a tile with a, with a letter on it. And um, we built this game and put it out in the App Store. We were actually one of the first, you know, we, were, we were there, opening day of the App Store. There were like 500 other apps. We sold our game, Amanji, which is still in the App Store, for $3.99. It was like a brilliant price point, you know. It was like nobody had any idea what to, what to uh, charge for things, so we charged $3.99 for it. And then we waited, because back then you didn't get stats every day on how well your, your game was doing. And um, so we waited, and you know, we're like, "This is pretty cool." You know, it's like you know, people are talking about you know games in the app store, and it's kind of a you know, it seems to be like it's some sort of a big deal. And you know, we were trying to get the media to cover our game and, and write about it and all of that. And a month later, we got our first paycheck. We made five thousand dollars. It was like awesome. You know, <laughs> it was great. So that was what that was like the hook. That was like, you know what? Hey, we spent a month making this thing. We made five grand. You know, if we make twelve a year, that's like almost a salary. You know, that's great. I can keep doing this. <laughs> So that was what, like, in my mind, was like, I'm going to focus on this and drop all the other kind of things that I was pursuing in terms of you know, other career options. And uh, that was the birth of Amanti Studios. And about six months later, or eight months later, uh, Natalia was <coughs> kind of helping me. My wife, Natalia, and I kind of co-founded the studio. So she uh, had been supporting us, but she was having so much fun kind of like working on her, in her spare time, working with me on this, that she quit her job. And we weren't making very much money at the time, but we were like, hey, we're making some money. The business is profitable. Let's do this. <laughs> very cool. That's a very good answer. So uh, I want you to actually take a moment to um, tell us a little bit about your working relationship with Natalia and, and sort of the foundation of the company yeah. and sort of the, the strength of that. You know, I, I've, I know a lot of people who have uh, worked with their significant others, you know, and they can find that to be uh, a very difficult challenge. In fact, a lot of people advise against it. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, how you guys have made this partnership work and if you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So it, it's been great. I mean, um, whenever we tell people that we're, you know, a husband and wife team working together making games, it's, you get a really polarized response. It's either like, wow, that's the awesomest thing ever. Like, I wish I could work with my wife every day and, and make stuff. That sounds great. Other people are like, oh my god, I can't believe you do that. I cannot imagine, you know, spending like a full day at work with my wife. Like, that just wouldn't happen. So, um, you know, the diet I get along great. And um, we actually have kind of great complementary skills when it comes to um, making games. And I think one of the things I love about games is that it encompasses like all these different facets of you know, different careers. I mean, you've got the, you know, the technical aspects of programming, you've got art, you've got music, you've got story, you've got the business side of running a business, marketing, you know, all these things together. I mean, it's really fun um, and, it, and it kind of, you know, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of different things and it like pulls it all together for me and that's what I love about making games. And um, the two of us are both software engineers. But Natalia is also like a you know, classically trained pianist. So she did all of our music and sound effects for it. It's like a really kind of complimentary skill. Um, she's also really into writing. So she's also really good with kind of like the story aspect of things where I, I'm totally not good at writing. So um, you know, that lends itself is also to kind of like the, the business side of the marketing and the PR. She's really good at like that kind of stuff as well. Now, I'm probably more technical than, than her and uh, more focused on like some of the like intricate you know, subsystems of the game design and everything. Um, and I'm kind of more of a, you know, a gamer gamer than, you know, she's probably more of a casual gamer. So kind of the two of us combined, it's like we, we kind of hit on this, this sweet spot of, you know, in two people being able to actually create games or something. The only thing we were really terrible at and really missing is art. And we realized that early on and that's why we focused, you know, our early games on games that didn't require a lot of art. But uh, the very first person that we started working with was an artist because that was like a huge gap. Making games, you need to make them look awesome. You need to work with somebody professional. Um, but you know, we, we really work together really well. I think we have the complementary skills. And um, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's just been great you know, for, um, for us you know, to be able to build this thing together. I think it's made us stronger as a couple. And you know, we've definitely fought over things in time. We get really passionate about uh, aspects of the business. Um, Natalia is usually right. Uh, but, <laughs> but it, you know, it's been great, and, and so I'm just really excited. You know, it's really fun that you know we get to share this aspect of our lives too. You know, in addition to you know, being married, we get to work together. It's great. Very cool. Thank you. Um, so in my intro, I mentioned that you had, uh, in the last a little bit over a year ago, 
uh, relocated into Raleigh. And I'm kind of curious if you could just um, say a little bit about your connection to this area and sort of why you know coming back here made sense for you guys and, and you know what you hope to accomplish here. Yeah, we get asked this a lot. You know, like, why didn't you move to San Francisco? You know, <laughs> why, aren't, why aren't you in Silicon Valley? Um, so we actually just moved from Washington, D.C. That's where we, we had, Natalia and I met working together at the company that I you know, worked at previously. Um, and so we were both in Washington, D.C. for work. And uh, we didn't have a lot of ties to the area, but we lived there about 10 years. And you know, we, we thought it was a cool place and it was a lot of fun. But you know, really everything in D.C. is really overshadowed by like government and politics and government contracting and defense and all this stuff. So the, the, you know, the, I, I've always felt like the, you know, the creative community there, the arts, the you know, game developers, that kind of thing. There, are, you know, there is some of that going on, but it's, it's really kind of overshadowed by everything. Um, and it, you know, it's expensive, it's loud, it's crowded, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's a big city, you know, it's what you expect. Um, so we were, you know, we've been there a while, so you know, that's where we kind of started doing our, you know, our company, but, um, you know, we always kind of felt like we wanted to go somewhere else. And when you work for yourself as an indie developer, it's kind of awesome, you can go anywhere, you can work anywhere, you have a laptop. So, you know, like the, the you know, the world was our oyster, we could kind of figure out wherever we wanted to go, but that was actually kind of, a challenge too, because when you have so many options, sometimes it makes it hard to figure out where to go. Um, but uh, you know, I actually grew up in Cary, uh, went to high school uh, in, in this area, and uh, my parents still live here. And Natalia and I actually have a 10-month-old daughter now, so like it was kind of important for us to stay on the East Coast. Uh, we wanted to be near family, uh, since this was the first uh, grandchild on both sides. And um, Raleigh, kind of in my mind, was a great place to come because there, there's fantastic. You know, there's fantastic kind of games industry here. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of you know, companies doing amazing things. You know, obviously like Epic and Insomniac and Red Storm. But there's also a great like indie community in the area. So there's a lot of smaller developers doing great things. So I really like that aspect of there being a lot of other people making games in the area. Um, you know, the cost of living is, is fantastic. The quality of life is, is very high. It's a very family friendly place. Um, there's also a, a kind of an incredible amount of talented people in the area. I mean, between you know you, you got Duke and UNC and, and uh, NC State and you've got you know Wake Community you know, College and, and all these other great programs that are kind of in the area. I and mean, there's a lot of really talented people that are, are you know come to Raleigh for, for school but also stay here because they, they like the area. So it just seemed like you know this could be a really great place for us, not only personally, but also as a, a place where we can call our home and we, where we can build our uh, our build our business. And um, you know that that's something that's important to us because you know we've kind of grown out of this like you know you know, husband and wife, small indie team, we're, we're, you know, we're six people now, and we're, probably, we're, we're actually in the process of growing, we're, we're going to open an office in the, in the area this year, and so we really wanted somewhere that would work for the business as well as for our personal life. Very cool. Okay, so uh, how many folks here have an iO I device, iOS device? Or Android. Or Android. Yes, <laughs> let us not forget that platform. Um, and so I'm at, how many of you have played Temple Run? <laughs> all right. How many of you have uh, maxed out your skills on the original game, or ground it all out, or at least plot your way through? All right. Yeah. Those no, are the, ones, the keynote. The, yeah. key, the keynote <laughs> outlines you folks. Yes, I, I have also ground it all out as well. Um, so you know, Temple Run was a, a little bit of a success, I would say, and um, you know, it's um, it's very interesting because now free to play is just. Uh, dominant, the dominant. It's, it feels that free to play is dominant in the app store and in mobile in general. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about sort of the the, the idea that sort of illuminated and kind of um, led to Temple One's production, and then if you could talk about sort of the ideas and the design behind that free to play model and and sort of how how um, you guys came to understand that. Sure. Uh, great question. A lot of a lot of parts to that. I think um, so. The inspiration for Temple Run kind of came out of our previous game, Max Adventure. How many people played Max Adventure? I'm willing to bet not many. Okay, good. Yeah, one. Thank you. <laughs> um, Max Adventure um, for us was a huge flop. We spent a year making it, um, and you know, we thought it would take like six months. It took a year, and <laughs> it was it was kind of a good launch at the time, but it just it, it got it got buried. We launched it at Christmas. EA did this huge thing where they like every game they had was ninety nine cents, and we you know we kind of did pretty well like when we first launched it, but it just totally drowned in the sea of apps, which is, seems to be a common thread you know for for apps is that you know, the reality is there's a lot of competition and uh, most of them don't do well. But it you know it was a total flop for us, and whatever you know 
with all of our games, we always, after we launch them, we spend a lot of time kind of thinking about them. Because, you know, you pour your heart into something, and you're like, oh, it didn't do well. Why didn't it do well? What can we do next time to make it do better? You know, and, or, or what can we do to fix it? You know, that's kind of usually the first thing that goes through your mind, is you spend all this time, you want to put more effort into it to make it better. Um, with Max Adventure, we were trying to kind of make more of a, a gamer game. You know, it's a dual stick shooter is what I call it, kind of like an action adventure game where you're a little kid trying to save the, uh, you know, your neighborhood's been invaded by aliens and you're trying to rescue your friends and kind of save the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, it was on the iPhone using kind of the virtual dual stick controllers, which is, you know, very popular on consoles and things, but um, not a great fit for mobile devices. The, the kind of control scheme, it's, uh, it's something that people that are gamers really, you know, understand and know how to use. But on a touch screen, you know, even though you want to try to make those games using that control scheme, it doesn't work very well because you can't actually feel the joysticks and you, you have to keep looking down. You're also blocking part of the screen with your thumbs. It just wasn't a good fit. I always loved making 3D stuff. Like in college, I studied a lot of computer graphics, so I, I really love making 3D games. So I, you know, I was really kind of annoyed by this fact that we had we had to resort in making that game to using these dual stick controllers. And it just didn't work well. I think it alienated a ton of people. My mom never even figured out how to finish the tutorial, so that should have been a real sign that you know, this game was never going to go anywhere. Um, so we started tinkering with that. We kind of identified that as one of the big flaws. There were many flaws in that game as far as why it wasn't commercially successful, but that was the one that kind of annoyed me the most. And we focused in on that, and we were experimenting around with you know, how can we control uh, a character in a, in a 3D world. and um, you know, make it intuitive and kind of something that would fit with the touch screen. And we experimented with a lot of things. We actually did it all inside of Max Adventure. So we had, you know, this game. I just took the code for it and started tinkering around with different ways to control it. The first thing we came up with was the idea that, you know, you're, you're kind of, you already had the kind of three quarters perspective in, in, um, t in Max Adventure. And the first thing we tried is like, oh, well, what if you, you, you imagine like, you know, the, the player kind of walking all the time and you try to rotate the world like by using, like treating it as a record almost, like he's walking on a record. And you had the iPad on the table and you could kind of drag your finger around and it would change which direction he was facing it. Terrible idea, it made you totally dizzy because the whole world's spinning and the character is still. But you know, I thought we were on to something. It was like, you know, this is what always works really well on these touch screen devices is input that's very direct. And you know something like you're touching the, f the screen or dragging your finger, or, you know, it's very very direct. You're, you're manipulating something in the world. So we decided to kind of iterate on it a little bit more, and we came up with this concept of using swipes to turn the character 90 degrees as he's walking forward. And this was actually much better if you, when you had the character behind, you know, the camera behind the character, and you were swiping left and right. Kind of felt like you were flicking the character around on the screen, kind of nudging him to do the things that you wanted to do. And so we we, we developed that nugget of the mechanic for Temple Run there. That was kind of the genesis of it all. And once we kind of came up with this control nugget, it was all about how do we turn that into a game? You know, we've got an idea, it's something different. We hadn't seen any other games that weren't doing that. So it was kind of novel. We felt like it worked really well because you could play, you know, you could kind of control the character on an iPhone if you're holding it in portrait with one hand. And I, you know, I think that's something that's very important for, um, for, for cell phone games is to be able to play it with one hand. And, um, so we were toying around with it, and the first thing that you know, we had as we're walking around in Max Adventure's world, there was coins around. It was kind of fun to kind of try to get the character to go and find the coins. Um, and we started thinking more and more about the types of environments that would, uh, you know, that would lend itself well to maybe some challenging or interesting gameplay if you had a character that was moving in that way. Um, and we had the idea of like making this endlessly generated kind of random maze, because mazes have lots of 90 degree turns, seemed like a perfect kind of environmental fit for it. And, um, you know, at first, that's what the game was about. Is like you're just running in this, and this is all prototype stuff. So it's just you know, squares and not much art at this point because we got away from Max Adventure and kind of built this maze thing. And um, you know, you run along this, this straight line, and then you try to swipe when you got close enough to the end. And you know, there's all sorts of challenges with that. You know, it was like really, really a reflex kind of timing-based thing, and it was like kind of imprecise. And you know, we uh, kind of just kept iterating on it and iterating on it. And the more you kept playing this prototype, the more it looked like you should be on some sort of wall. Like you're on the Great Wall of China, or you're on like, some sort of a temple. And, you know, so we just started the art kind of followed along with this mechanic and this prototype till we built it out and kind of settled on the, the adventurous kind of, the adventurer theme kind of with an ink and Mayan kind of ruined um, you know, area for it. And that was, that was really kind of how we built Temple Run. And, and you know, it took us five months from that initial kind of conception to having something on the App Store for, for Temple Run. It was, it was very fast. Um, the freemium thing is kind of interesting because we had never made a freemium game before Temple Run. 
we had always been doing premium, well, premium 99 cent games, you know, as, as premium as that, as that can be. Um, but um, we actually launched Temple Run at, as a 99 cent game. Like we, we had seen all these people doing freemium stuff and we knew that was something that was up and coming. You know, everybody was, that was kind of the direction that a lot of this stuff was, the, the, the industry was going in. And um, we, we uh, one of our friends had actually made this um, game out. Have any of you guys played Zombie Gunship from Limbic Software? Yeah, a couple of folks. Uh, it was a pretty awesome little game, but they actually had a lot of success with it being a 99 cent game plus uh, in-app purchases. And they were kind of consumable net purchases, or they had a virtual currency, that, and um, but you also paid 99 cents for it. And I'm like, well, that's kind of an awesome way to go. You know, you can make a game that's premium, but also is set up like a freemium game. And then in the back of my mind, I was always like, well, we've never done freemium, so we're a little too scared to just release it as a free game straight up after we've spent six months or five months developing it. So what we could do is we could see if it'll work as a premium game. And if it works as a premium game, great, we're done. You know, if it doesn't work as a premium game, in our back pocket we have that option to go free, and then we can see if it works as a freemium game. It also gives us a second chance in the App Store, which is very rare. I mean, you can you can launch a game, and if it fails, you know, you think you can do an update and get people excited about it again. Forget it. All the media is covering what's new, what came out today. Like you're not really going to get a second chance. But going free is almost like you do get a second chance because there's a lot of services out there that watch premium games and go free and it kind of creates some more buzz and people love getting stuff for free that was once paid. So it didn't work out for us as a paid game. Like it actually was our best launch ever. It did really well. We had like a four and a half or five star kind of review average and it kind of rose up the charts but it fell just like every other game that we ever made usually does. And then you kind of wait to see how well it bottoms out. Um, but we decided a month in that we were going to try it out as free. Because what do we have to lose? We'll relaunch it, try it as free. It's already not working. Let's give it a shot. And we launched it as, as free a month in. And um, we did a lot of promotion kind of around being, being free and, and media covered again. It was really like a second chance for us. And the same thing, it like shot up the charts on the free side. But it didn't stick again. It kind of you know, hit number three and kind of started falling charts. And then I was, oh, I guess this game doesn't happen. But what happened was it actually stopped falling at number 100, top three, which is, you know, that's great in itself. And what was really interesting is that at that spot in the free charts, people were buying the in-app purchases, and it was actually making more money than it was making as a as a game. So it was a no-brainer for us to keep it free. Um, and uh, you know what started off as what was going to be kind of a limited time free offer turned into we're just going to make this free game. And it <laughs> sat there at number 100, and it didn't you know it didn't go to number one overnight. But over the course of about three months, from like September until it actually hit number one on New Year's Eve, which was pretty exciting, um, it just kind of slowly snowballed. Like it slowly got more people playing it. You know, more people were downloading it. People were still buying stuff, which was fantastic. And uh, every day, more more people were playing it. It slowly climbed up the charts. And um, we didn't touch anything during that time. Nothing changed. Like you know, it was when we changed it to be from being paid to being free, that was the only difference. We didn't we didn't re architect the game to be freemium. It was already kind of designed to be freemium. And it slowly rose the charts. And really what happened is the game went you know, it essentially went viral. We weren't spending money on ads, we weren't doing any of that, paying for users. Um, it just went viral. People were playing it and more and more people were playing it every day and people kept playing it. You know, the reten the user retention on top of run is like a hundred times higher than any one of the other games we've ever played before. People just, would have, for whatever reason, it became like their go-to game. And they kept coming back to it. And I, and, I, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. And I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about you know, what aspects of the game maybe made that happen. And I think you know, a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's really easy to like, learn how to play it, but there's also a lot of depth with it. There's a lot of achievements. There's a lot of things to unlock or power up. Um, there's also kind of this social element built into it, but not even really coded into it. It's just kind of people like sharing their high scores and they like competing with other people in this game and, and trying to best their friends. And I think that's a lot of why you know, people you know, were playing it and it was spreading on its own. It went viral and it hit number one. It hit number one you know, on three charts and it stayed number one grossing for about a month when it first launched. And it's, you know, it's been doing fantastic ever since. And you know, we've launched the sequel, but that's kind of the, the story of Temple Run. Wow. Um, so the last numbers I heard saw Temple Run downloads at over 80 million worldwide. Is that correct, or is uh, that a new number you so would that, give that, that? that would that at the time probably was just the Temple Run 2 numbers. Okay. We hit. Uh, <laughs> 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 
I think uh, I think like worldwide, Temple Run one and two, and I, I not counting Oz and Brave and all those things because you know, they, I can't talk about the numbers for those. Um, uh, you know, it's like over three hundred million kind of combined. I think Temple Run two, the last thing we announced was that it, I forget if we announced that it, I think we announced that it hit fifty million in the first two weeks or something, which is kind of an insane number of downloads. <laughs> I mean, it's still, the, the stats around Temple Run just boggle my mind, you know, in terms of uh, you know, how many people have played this game. We did this cool infographic for our one-year anniversary where it kind of like broke it down by country and, and regions and everything. And uh, the, uh, the, the most amazing stat to me was if you looked at like how many downloads we had in the U.S. and like what percentage of the population that it was, it was like 12% of the population at the time had played Temple Run. And I was just like... Wow, that's a lot of people, you know? That's crazy. Uh, how do you comprehend that? It's, it's really, really nuts. And I think if you think about it, like, you know, the, the, the people that are mostly playing our game are the kids, you know? So I think there's probably, like, a, a section of our population, you know, that, like, kids in elementary and middle school and high school is, like, that kind of age that, you know, probably, like, 50% of them or more have played this game. So it's, it's, really, it's really awesome and kind of mind-boggling. So. Yeah. Very cool. So, so you guys have this fantastic success. And... Uh, you know, one day the phone rings, and it's the folks from Disney who have a new movie that they want to promote. And I'm curious if you could uh, talk about, um, you know, what it was like working with Disney and um, sort of how it felt to have them come knocking at your door after, uh, you know, the time that you had the Temple Run. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. With, with the, the success that Temple Run had, all of a sudden, you know, we were getting a lot of attention, you know, and, and as a three-person studio at the time, uh, it was kind of overwhelming. And, um, you know, we, uh, I think everybody had seen what, what Angry Birds and Rio had done in terms of, like, a collaboration with a movie, and, like, Hollywood was calling us all the time. Like, it was kind of crazy, you know? Um, and we talked to a lot of people wanting to do kind of crossovers with us, and, you know, we, uh, as a small team, you know, it's, 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 it's often hard to engage in a lot of that, you know, because, you, you know, it could be a huge distraction to what's, you know, the core of your business, or it could be something really good. Um, what we found with Disney was a great partner. I mean, you know, it's been a real pleasure working with them, and um, you know, they, they kind of helped augment our team and helped you know build the, you know those those kind of spin-off versions of Temple Run. And it's been really fun working with them because, you know, especially when we when we did the very first one, we were working with Pixar. And like Pixar is one of my favorite companies of all time, and it was just like a lifelong dream to even do anything with them. And so when we started talking to them about doing something, it seemed like a really good fit because we're. We're always very sensitive about the things that we do and how they tie into our brand. You know, uh, I can't tell you how many you know people from Hollywood called about movies that made no sense to do a crossover with Temple Run. You know, they're like, like, okay, that's you know that would be maybe a cool game if you you know had that, but it, like, what does it have to do with Temple Run? It has nothing to do with Temple Run. What was great, I think, about both um, Brave and Oz was that it kind of fit in with the adventuresome spirit of Temple Run um, and. Like the you know the environments even kind of like you know, from those movies like they, you know, they often look kind of similar to some of the vibe that we were going for. And with Brave, you know, Brave was about you know this 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 young girl Merida, you know, and she had this very adventurous you know adventurous spirit to her, and you know even down to little things like her hair is red, you know, I'm like our main character's hair is red, that's awesome, you know. So it, there was uh, you know we were really sold on working with them the very first time, and you know they they came to us just wanting to do anything, and we saw the trailer to Brave, and there's like a scene in the trailer where like Merida is just kind of like running away from the bear and Mordu and on the horse and kind of galloping through all these like you know, beautiful scenery in Scotland, and they're like, man, this, this, this shares like a common vibe with Temple Run. Like I could totally see a game crossed, you know, between that world and our game and seeing how it fits. And um, you know, that, that's kind of how we came about that. Cool. So when you, when you look at the uh, the list of successful small developer studios, uh, Blambeer, Semi Secret, Nimblebit, Manji. Um, <coughs> you notice that, uh, that these folks have created and, and developed very successful products. Um, and the big guys haven't ignored that. And they certainly haven't ignored or missed the success of Temple Run or any of the other games. And there, and there are a lot of folks you know, who have seen and Nimblebit had a, a very big story about, you know, the, the, the Tiny Tower clone that had mm -hmm. kind of come out. And I was wondering if you could, um, you know, talk to us a little bit about um, how, that, how that impacts, you know, your business, if you would, but also really uh, from the development side of being a very small studio that, you know, you know took a major pay cut to take a risk. You know, how, how, does, how, does, how do you feel about 
cloning of, of games, especially as it relates to mobile games? Um, you know, I, I think the cloning kind of thing is, it's, it's flattering on one hand that people think what we made is so awesome that they also want to make something like that or inspired by that. And it, it can also be very frustrating. I mean, there's a lot of clones out there that like literally like, took our icon, turned it blue, and you know, <laughs> had the exact same game, same tutorial, same everything with like some very slightly different art. And you're like, well, it's really frustrating. It's like, you know, come on, you know, try to add something new. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be making a game, you know, don't try to just make something exactly the same as something else. You know, um, I mean, I think this industry, really any art kind of industry, is um, is built upon kind of iterating on great ideas and, and, and building new things that are inspired by other things. And I think that's fine, but I think you got to try to bring something new to the table whenever you're doing things. And it's a very gray line as far as like what's considered a clone and too close to something versus what's considered um, you know, innovative and new and, and awesome. You know, it's a very, very fine line. And, and I think everybody has their own kind of comfort with where that line is. And it's different for everybody. So, um, you know, I, I think that to me the most frustrating aspects of it are the ones that are too close. And, and for us as a small team in particular, like it actually can cause us a lot of pain and trouble. And you know, yeah, when somebody co does come up with an app that's you know the same icon as yours but blue and it's sitting on top of the charts at number one, you know, that's 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 extremely insulting and it's frustrating and it's also a legal issue because people think that maybe we had something to do with it. And usually these apps are kind of like scam apps and you know, are, are just used to show ads or used to harvest your contact information, especially on Android, since like anything kind of slips through the gate over there. Um, there's been some, you know, when, before we had Temple Run, the original on Android, it was like kind of like a five month gap or so between when we launched it and when it happened. There were a lot of these like countdown apps and you know, look, you look at the list of permissions that they have access to and it's like, oh, read your whole contact list, you know, do this and that, and you're like, yeah, that's pretty scary. So it's actually kind of, it could be something that is damaging to us. We actually have to spend time and effort going after these guys, working with a lawyer, you know, working to protect your IP, and working to get these things taken down. And when you're three people, that totally sucks. I want to spend all my time making games. I don't want to spend my time you know, on, the, on the legal aspects of it. But really, that's, that's a side of the business that you have to deal with. So you know, every second I spend doing that takes time away from making you know, Temple Run better or making future games. And that's, you know, that, that's what's most frustrating about to me. So um, let me see how much time we have here. So OK, I'm going to. I'm going to actually uh, ask Keith one more question, and then I'm going to allow the audience to direct questions uh, in his direction. It's been a long conference, folks. <laughs> um, so I'd like to you know you mentioned um, a little bit about the fact that you guys were going to open up a shop, and that you know you had you had six folks. Um, you know what's what's coming up for Emanji? Maybe not specifically about projects, but I'm just kind of curious about you know what your projections are for the company. What what is it that you want it to become? So I got into doing this because I, you know, I, I love making games, and that's what I want to continue to do. Our goal is never to like become the next EA or Zynga and build like a 500, you know, person company. That, that's not what we're trying to do. I like being small. I like, you know, personally, I like being involved with the, you know, the day-to-day -day creation of, of games. That's, that's what I really love. That's my passion. Um, so kind of in in our case, um, you know. Having a success like Temple Run has been awesome because it lets us do whatever we want. It you know, kind of opens up creative freedom to us because we can we can do that. But it's also a little bit of a curse in the sense that you know we have this responsibility to kind of keep Temple Run going. And you know that, I'll tell you what, people really really want more and more Temple Run, so we kind of keep that engine going. We have to keep feeding that. As a small studio, that's become all-consuming for us in the past year. You know, we were three and. That's what we spent all of our time doing. We didn't get to work on new games. So that's, that's a little bit frustrating, even though we've had this awesome success and we're totally grateful for that. Still want to kind of continue to be working on new things, but we're super busy with, you know, with Temple Run right now. So that was kind of our, um, the reason it, you know, we thought about growing. I mean, we, there, there's really a couple of paths that, I, that we saw as far as what we could do with our company next. Like one was like, you know what, Temple Run, that's been awesome. Let's just you know, kind of you know, let, it, let it do its thing, and we're going to go on and, and work on the next thing. And, well, that does great. That's definitely you know, a very viable thing to do. Um, another option was like, hey, maybe we could chop the company around and just sell it and then retire and you know, sit back and do nothing. Um, and then the other option was like, why not, you know, maybe we can grow the team. Maybe we can get to a place where you know, we have a, a little bit bigger team, um, you know, a team that can you know, keep Temple Run going and you know, keep the fans happy there and you know, keep, keep kind of innovating in that space of this you know, incredible kind of IP that we've created. But also kind of 
grow to the point that we can also start exploring these things as well and have a little bit more bandwidth and breathing room to do that. So, um, you know, I, I think it would just be silly to let Temple Run die and let run this course go into the next thing, so we're not doing that. <laughs> you know, and uh, selling the company, you know, that's never, that we didn't get in, we don't have investors, we don't have any venture funding or any of that nonsense, so there's no pressure for us to sell the company. You know, I don't, I don't think I, you know, if somebody gave me some sort of a ridiculous offer, I, you know, I, maybe I would take it. You know, I definitely would consider it. Darn, why not? Who wouldn't? You know? um, but that's not my goal. Like, I, I didn't get into this because I just wanted to sell the company. And I feel like, well, you know, if I did sell the company, I could get back to making games and do it. It's kind of like building everything I've already built and doing it again. So growing the company to me seems like the better answer. It seems like we could um, you know, continue to be really successful and continue to make games and continue Temple Run and kind of continue building it into this kind of huge global brand. Um, but at the same time, uh, get to a point where we can make more. So we're, um, you know, we're, I'm really excited about that of, of, you know, being able to create a company and, and foster a very creative environment where, you know, it 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 it, uh, it, it uh, really encourages people to explore and, and build and, and kind of try to come up with the next great game or the next Temple Run or the next whatever. And, you know, just a, a place that would be, you know, a fun place to come into work. With. That's that's. Ultimately, I'm trying to build a treehouse for myself, you know, and have all my friends come and work with me. I mean, that that to me seems like uh, you know an, an awesome life plan. You know, very cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we will uh, open up to questions that you guys might have. Um, you know, uh, I'll just ask you for the sake of the recording to make sure that you repeat the questions into the microphone. Sure. And uh, we'll uh, we'll let you guys ask. And I see Mr. Red Shirt. Yes. Um, obviously, with your game, Max Adventures, you were interested in other control styles than just uh, touch airframes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> because you guys are growing and you guys are thinking about going to other uh, avenues, do you think that will jump into the console PC space? Or do you think that doesn't have to do with like yeah. all these things? Yeah, so the question is, you know, do we, do we think that uh, we'll, we'll kind of expand beyond the mobile space into other platforms where, you know, maybe different control schemes might work. Or, you know. um, I, you know, with, with Temple Run, we're absolutely taking it, we're trying to get it as many places as we can. So we're already, you know, we're on iOS, we're on uh, Android, we're on the Amazon App Store. Um, I'd love to see it everywhere. I'd love to see it on Steam, I'd love to see it on the console, I'd love to see, like, a Connect game, like, just a million different, like, you know, Temple Run, anywhere anybody wants to play with it. That, like, I, you know, that, that's kind of on our roadmap of the things that we want to do. Um, and, uh, you know, so yeah, part of that will be getting into kind of some of these other consoles. You know, and I think there's, when you're in any business, you always have to kind of keep an eye out for, you know, what's next in the space, you know, like what's beyond mobile, you know, there, there's a lot of exciting kind of interesting stuff going on in like the micro console space. Like the console space has been very closed off for a long time. There's been gatekeepers and you have to be, you know, of a certain size to really get, you know, any, any traction or be able to get on those platforms. And, you know, the idea of, um, a console where it's it's more well, you know let's say uh, more like the like open like the App Store open like you know, Android that that's kind of that's an interesting thing I don't know I mean our, our, our heart is kind of in mobile so I think we're gonna we're gonna continue to be a mobile first company that's that's our um, you know I, I feel like just the, the the kind of huge amount of uh, you know, customers and, and players that you have access to is really interesting I've always been interested in more casual games in terms of the types of games we make so games that are family friendly and that you know kind of anybody can play. And um, I think mobile is a fantastic space for that because you have so many people playing games on mobile that would not consider themselves gamers and wouldn't play games on a console ever. So it's just kind of neat to be able to make things that, uh, like my mom, you know, can play, or you know, my brother who doesn't play games can play. You know, I think that's that's cool. Uh, I mean, the UIA is interesting. You know, I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm not working on any anything for the UIA yet. Um, I, I would like to tinker with one. I think that could be cool, but. Uh, it's yet to be seen. I think we, we're also, you know, we have to realize that we're a, uh, you know, we are still a small team, so uh, it's hard for us to kind of go off in a lot of different directions. So for new platforms, it's more of a kind of wait and see until it's kind of more, feels like it's more viable. Yeah. Question? Rather than selling the company, did you ever consider or get an offer to sell the rights or IP or someone? So the question is, you know, instead of selling the company, have we ever, you know, been approached to or thought about um, you know, selling off the IP rights to Temporon or something like that. Um, yeah, I definitely thought about it. You know, it's it's uh, you know, I think in our case, you know, like our, our company essentially is Temple Run at this point. So, like, I think we kind of have to probably come along with it. If, if you know, if that that would be part of the, uh, the deal. Um, well, we haven't really seriously pursued any of this stuff just because it's not anything that's super interesting to us. I think I would have a hard time personally, like, 
letting go of this thing we created and like, you know, here, you know, uh, whoever, you know, you guys go and, <laughs> and, and continue building it and then like sitting back for the next five years just watching like where it goes. Like, I don't know, that could be a little scary. <laughs> More questions? Um, how have analytics, uh, looking at analytics, improved um, your game? Yeah, um, so the question is how have anal looking at analytics um, helped you know, us make games? Um, you know, I, think, uh, I think there's a lot more that we probably could be doing with analytics than we are currently doing with analytics. Um, you know, I think in terms of like companies that are out there and like where they fall on the spectrum of how analytics heavy they are, I think you know if you look at like Zynga and they're like, hey, we're an analytics first company. I think we're like on the opposite end of that spectrum. We're a like, gameplay first company. So we mostly um, design games from you know that's the, the the fun standpoint before we start thinking about like how to monetize them or how to do this and that. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, the great things that we use analytics for are um, you know things like. Understanding, you know, a you know, crash reporting type stuff, super helpful. Trying to understand, you know, when you have, you, know, you can imagine when you have hundreds of millions of people playing your game, that the smallest, most random little bug that you know only hits like the, the you know less than one percent of the players actually becomes an issue, and people find that stuff. So we um, we have to really stay on top of a lot of that, and it's really kind of you know focus help it's kind of made us like you know get better about QA and a lot of that kind of stuff just because you know it's really scary when you put a release out there and it's you know it's going out to millions of people that you know eh, if this crashes at launch that's gonna be a problem. <laughs> I'm gonna get a lot of angry emails. Um, so you know we, we use it for that kind of stuff. We also use it for um, you know general general metrics on you know how many people are playing your games, you know, is the trend going up, is it going down, is it flat, you know, where is it going? Um, you know, how long you know, how long do people kind of stay in, inside of the game? How long do they play on average? How long do they you know, have, you know do they play for a month before you know moving on to something else? Do they play for a year, like you know, or a week? How, you know, what, what are those kind of stats? Um, we also you know, these days we, we, since we don't have anybody on our team that's like a dedicated stats person, you know, it's more of like when, whenever we have a certain question that we want answered, then we try to design some sort of analytic test that we can put in an update and kind of try to get a handle on that instead of just using our intuition or uh, you know our best guess. Uh, how did you go about marketing the first Great question. How, how did we go about marketing our first question? I think this is probably really applicable to like indies in general. How do you make your how do you make your game stand out in this app store where thousands of apps come out every night? I mean, I think that's probably the question we get asked the most. Um, and I don't think there is any like one silver bullet you know, answer to that. Um, as a indie developer, uh, you know, I think. Usually you don't have any money to spend <laughs> on launching stuff or doing ad campaigns or what. I don't know if you guys saw that stat that came out like this week that um, the Cut the Rope folks spent like a, over a million dollars uh, on the advertising campaign to launch their game. I'll tell you what, that is like the reality for like the big companies and how much money they spend at shooting something up the top of, of the charts. They're not a big company and they're, they're I would say, you know, kind of like a, 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 a successful indie turn kind of like, you know, small, medium-sized studio. But um, I mean, it's crazy how much money people spend on marketing games these days in the mobile space. Because how many games make a million dollars? I'll tell you what, not many. <laughs> uh, you know, less than probably one percent or something. It's it's really kind of staggering. So, um, big companies have that option. Many developers, that's not even something that crosses your mind. <laughs> you know, I would love to make a million dollars in a year versus like spending a million dollars on a weekend for an ad campaign. Um, so. Uh, you know, what we did as a small company over the five years that we've been making games on iOS is focus on building our, you know, our community, um, you know, focus on um, building our relationship with the various media outlets that cover, you know, games and the kinds of things we do. Um, we focused on uh, building a network um, within our other products to cross promote our other games so that we can, you know, if we're launching a new game, we can have in all of our old games, you know, some sort of an ad pop up or, you know, we have a listing of more games in every one of our apps. So I think, you know, it's like you kind of do all these things and we can't build it overnight. It's kind of one of those things that, you know, you build up over time. Um, you know, you try to interact with the community and, you know, we, you know, kind of very active on like the touch arcade forums when we used to launch games, that kind of thing. And, and you kind of, we you know, were active on Twitter and Facebook and you, you kind of do all these things. And it helps. It helps build up that 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 thing. And I think the thing we all we got really good at was you know um, giving an app 
when we when we were going to launch a new game, like you know, Temple Run at the time, or some of those, giving it a good shot at getting some initial buzz. You know, we could get all the media outlets to write about it. We could get, uh, you know, we could we cross promote it with all of other games, and we could get it to have some sort of a pop, and maybe make it into the top hundred, you know, paid games or you know, top hundred free games, and give it that initial shot. You know, and, and I think that. Um, or bad at is kind of like the, the tail end. How do you how do you sustain that over time? And I do that. And I, I, I still don't really know the answer to that, other than making a game that people want to come back to keep you know playing and you know try to make it viral. But you know how do you do that? I don't know. You know that's it, it's definitely very tough. But I think really um, you know really trying to interact with the community is a big thing because you're going to make fans over the years that are going to play all of your games and hopefully they'll come back and play your next game and being able to leverage that is, is really important. On uh, the back over there. Yeah, that that um, so how would we you know so since we've had a success kind of early in our career, um, how you know how would we react to maybe our next game not being a success? Um, I, you know, I have some experience with that. I think um, we actually. Uh, uh, our, our fourth game we ever made was Harbor Master, and that was like our first taste of success. Like that was the the game that uh, like made enough money for us to like you know, have an artist full time and uh, you know like actually support us all at a salary that was higher than our previous job salary. So that was like, hey, we're successful, you know. And um, you know we were like we worried about that at the time. We we're like, well, hey, is this the fluke, or you know, do we get lucky, or are we on to something, or you know, what's the next game going to be like? And I think, you know, um, we spent some time working on that thing that was successful and keeping that going and adding more updates to it, bringing it to the platforms and that thing. And I think you gotta do that. Like that's that's a no brainer. You gotta you know, you gotta take advantage of it while it's hot, you know, while you while you got something that's good. Uh, but then we also did get back to making more games. And we made before we made Temple Run, after that we made, let's see here, uh, Hippo High Dive, anybody play that? Nobody, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Geospark, anybody play that? Nobody. Yeah, not a big su success. Uh, we already did Max Adventure. Um, gosh, I think that might be all of them in between. Uh, probably forgetting something. But um, the point is, you know, we, we got back out there. We got back trying again. Yeah, it's frustrating that your game's not a success. But I think if you're going to work in this industry, I think the thing you got to get used to is that it is a hit-driven industry, and the majority of games do not succeed. And I think you gotta persevere. You gotta, you know, get back on the horse. You gotta try again, do something different, you know, and and uh, keep learning from your mistakes. You know, I feel like our two biggest hits, Harbor Master and Temple Run, came directly after our previous biggest failures because we spent a lot of time thinking about why that was a failure and what we could do differently. And I think, uh, you know, that's very important. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that. The odds are the next game we make after Temple Run is not going to be as successful as Temple Run. I think that's a really pretty tough thing to, you know, I mean, obviously if we make Temple Run 3 or 4 or 5 and like that kind of stuff, odds are that's going to be pretty, you know, that's going to be a success. Like that's a lot, a lot more comfortable. You always have to be kind of working on new things and you have to be open to, you know, the fact that it might fail. And yeah, it doesn't ever get easier. Every time something fails, it sucks, you know. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's just the way it is. But when something really succeeds, it feels really good. But I tell you what, after it succeeds and it starts going down a little bit, that sucks too. So it's like, you know, it's kind of relative and it's kind of like you're always chasing that next, you know, you know, it's like the next high or like the next chart topper. That's just, you know, it's just a crazy aspect of, of running a business and, and being a game developer, I think. Okay. Um, just what were some of the ultimate titles for Temple Run? And how, <laughs> how is running a company with a 10-month old? <laughs> Very tough. So the question was, what are alternate uh, names that we might have picked for Temple Run, and uh, how has it been running a company with a 10-month old? Um, well, I'll start with the other names. Temple Run was the only name we ever came up with for Temple Run. <laughs> it was like the stupid, obvious name, you know, that we were making this prototype, and we're running in a temple, we're like, let's call it Temple Run, you know? <laughs> I mean, I think you can really overthink game names, and... Um, the best ones that we've always come up with are the ones that were like kind of like the gut thing that we came up with at the time, and you know it's very descriptive and very you know it's, it's obvious what you're doing. And, you know, I, I like short names, not super long names. I want something that's going to fit on that icon under the you know on the on the springboard. So those are always things we consider. But yeah, not a ton of thought went into the name on that one. Uh, fortunately, I think it turned out to be a pretty good name. Um, 
running a company with a 10 month old now? Um, a lot easier than running a company with a two month old or one month old. <laughs> but still very challenging and very tough. It's definitely changed uh, the working dynamic for us a lot. Um, you know, where Natalia and I probably used to spend like 150% of our time working on, on uh, Imanji Studios. Um, I probably spend about 80%, maybe 75% of my time you know, compared to what I used to. And Natalia probably spends about 5% of the time. And that's not despite you know, like trying. You know, it's just it's really tough having a, a kid, and you know, we're taking care of the kid ourselves right now. We don't have any help. We don't have her in you know, daycare or anything. Um, so it's uh, kids take a lot of time and effort. For those of you that have kids, you know that. Um, uh, and so it's been really challenging. And I, I think um, that was another reason that uh, last year we, we grew the team a little bit was because you know we knew the baby was coming and we knew we were going to need help and uh, it definitely helped a lot. Um, and you know, we're, we're slowly both getting. You know, involved more and more, and, and kind of like ramping up our levels of involvement because uh, you know our daughters, you know, I, I think you know, we're requiring less and less, less, less you know, t attention. You know, but um, it still does take a lot of time and effort. <laughs> All right, we have time for one last question. Who will it be? Looks like okay. the guy back there. Yes, the question was uh, so people. You know, I guess essentially, people design games for a lot of different reasons. Like, you know, what's the main reason that you design games for? Um, I like that's a, that's a tough question, um, and it's a good one. I don't. I haven't gotten that one before, so I don't have a canned answer. Um, <laughs> I uh, I like I personally like the creative aspect of making the game. You know, I, I think like going from having nothing to creating something, that's really, that really drives me. Um, I also like, I, I like, um, so I, I like the challenge of just building it. Um, that, that appeals to me. I also like the fact that when you make games, uh, you can show it to other people and they understand what you do. Um, that's cool. Like, you know, anybody understands what people do when they make games. They're like, here, play it. <laughs> they might not like it. That's, uh, that happens a lot. Um, but they might like it and that's cool. Um, but uh, also, I'm kind of losing my, my thought on that. Um, I, I like making games that I want to play. I think that's important too. Because I think if you try to make games that you think someone else might like to play, or if you try to make a game that you think everybody would like to play, you're probably going to make a game that nobody wants to play. So I kind of feel like, you know what, I like playing games, and you know, I can make games. So the, the kinds of games that I'm going to be able to make best um, are the kinds of games that I understand and that are appealing and fun to me, because then I can turn to my gut and use that as a guidance for, um, for designing it. And I, and I think, I mean, the keynote was awesome because they talked about you know, understanding different perspectives of why um, you know, other people might play certain types of games. And I think as a game designer, that is a super important thing to learn. Um, and you know, for me, I've, like, I've always stayed in the comfort zone of the type of games that I like. So I, maybe I'm just lucky that the types of games I like also seem to have commercial appeal. That's great. Um, but you know, I, I think you know, looking at it from that perspective and from the keynote is, is an interesting way to go about it, uh, kind of expanding the types of games that other, other people want to make. But I, you know, I think really making games from the heart is, is to me, that's the, that's the most exciting part of it. Keith, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you for having me.